Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our last lecture of Polyglot Attack Conference. I have the privilege to introduce you to Professor Charles Sheng, um, who is a professor uh, at the Boston University. And uh, he does research in second language acquisition, phonetics, phonolo phonology, uh, psycholinguistics, and language development. And the title of his lecture tonight is Language, language Attrition in Relearning in Adulthood. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Charles. It's nice to, to have you among us. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to uh, show some slides. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, changes in uh, people's languages when they learn new languages and um, go to different environments over their lifetime. Um, and so I'll start with um, some background on um, this general phenomenon of uh, learning a second language and how that influences your first language. And I'll be using these abbreviations L2 for your second language and um, L1 for your first language, your native language. Um, and then I'll uh, kind of show how the field has um, arrived at some questions about how this type of influence takes place, um, especially in the context of bilingualism and multilingualism. And then I'll um, provide a, a, some data that um, kind of shows that uh, this view of um, language uh, in adulthood is kind of being um, solidified or uh, unchanging over time kind of uh, has to be revised because we see these sorts of changes happening um, all the time um, in people who are you know mature uh, adult speakers of, of the languages that they speak. Um, and then I'll um, end with some uh, uh, questions that, that, that still remain in the field. Um, okay, so um, just to start, uh, for some background, um, bilinguals, people who speak more than one language, are known to differ from people who speak only one language, monolinguals, um, in a number of ways. Um, and I've listed on this slide several of the, the ways that um, they differ, as shown in the literature. So um, there have been um, people who've tried to compare bilinguals and monolinguals in kind of um, broad psychological constructs, uh, such as executive control, um, which refers to this um, uh, collection of abilities that, that people use to, for example, um, ignore distraction and focus on one, one given task. Um, and bilinguals have also been shown to differ from monolinguals in very specific um, linguistic variables, so um, aspects of their native language use and performance at all different levels. So um, just to take a, a couple of the examples here, morphos morphosyntax referring to kind of the structure of words and the structure of sentences. Bilinguals might use sentence structure differently than monolinguals in a specific language. And what I'll be talking about today mostly is um, phonetics and phonology, um, the, the sound system of a language, everything including uh, listening skills and also uh, pronunciation. Um, these abilities uh, or uh, parts of the language have also been um, observed to change over time um, with new language experience. So <clears throat> um, a broad question, given all of that um, evidence that uh, bilinguals uh, differ from monolinguals. A large question has been um, kind of, we know that L, a second language to uh, first language influence takes place, but um, clearly it can't be just, you know, everything that gets influenced by the second language. So this question about what are the constraints on this influence has um, spurred a lot of research in this area. And there have been various proposals as to um, what are sort of the, the factors involved in limiting um, how much a second language can influence your native language. So there have been proposals uh, that this type of phenomenon only happens in people who speak an L2 a second language to a very, very proficient degree. So very late in the process of second language development. There have been proposals that it's limited to where two parts of the language system uh, interface with each other. So um, for example, words, uh, are built up and then they're also put in uh, sentences. And so there's an interface between the, those two components of the grammar. Um, so proposals like this, unfortunately, often don't uh, hold uh, generally. And we see um, counter evidence to all of these hypotheses. So we see examples, for example, um, in the case of 
uh, advanced L2 proficiency, this hypothesis. We see examples of um, L2 influence in people who are not very advanced in the L2. And then we also see examples of L2 influence in um, uh, aspects of the native language that probably are not at an interface between two parts, but are, are within one part itself. So um, this leaves us still with the question of, okay, well, you know, when can this happen and when can't it? Um, clearly, um, uh, the second language, uh, when it influences speech production, pronunciation, in the first language, it happens all over the place and it also happens pretty quickly. Um, and so there's been a whole body of work that's examined different aspects of pronunciation, uh, both in terms of the overall uh, accent that someone might have in, in, the second in the first language, as well as um, very specific acoustic properties of um, how people speak. So uh, VOT is uh, an abbreviation for voice onset time. This refers to kind of how much air or aspiration comes out of someone's mouth when they say a consonant like T or P or K. Um, F0 stands for fundamental frequency. This uh, is referring to the, um, the voice pitch basically and um, how high or low it is. And then F1, F2, F3, these are spectral uh, components of, of speech that have to do with, um, in the case of vowels, have to do with where exactly in the mouth the vowel is being produced. Um, so these are ways to measure aspects of pronunciation. Um, so in, in a variety of ways, um, the second language is known to influence pronunciation in the native language, but it also influences um, other aspects of the native language, like how you hear a certain sound, perception, and then also how you might recognize words or how quickly you might recognize words um, in your first language as well. So um, being able to categorize phonemes or sounds, recognize words, and then also break up the speech into different parts. Um, these abilities have also been shown to, to be influenced um, by learning a new language. Um, <clears throat> So I'm just going to show a couple of examples uh, that are very well known in this literature on um, bilinguals and um, the L2 influencing the L1. Uh, the first one being from Jim Flagey. So this Flagey uh, 1987 study is about um, people who speak both English and French. Um, but their backgrounds are all different from each other. So some people in this study are native speakers of English and they learned French. Some people are native speakers of French and then they learned English. And in this graph, what you see on the y-axis, the vertical, is um, that uh, acoustic property of VOT. So again, uh, um, related to aspiration. Um, and then there's two lines here that show kind of what the normal range of this um, property for the T consonant is in French. So monolingual French speakers um, have pretty low or short VOT uh, when they say French T, whereas English speakers, monolingual English speakers, um, they have a much longer value for uh, this property VOT for the English T, which is to say English T and French T are very different from each other. Um, so what happens to the way these people pronounce T in their native language when they learn the other language, which has a different T? So that's the question in the study. And um, each of these sets of bars, which represents a, a group of people, um, has two, two bars. One of them is for uh, French in black, the French T, and then one of them is white uh, for the English T. And the two groups I want you to pay attention to are the ones on the right, the Americans in Paris. So these are native English speakers who are immersed in French. And then uh, the uh, French women in Chicago, group E, which are native French speakers who are living in an English uh, speaking environment. Both of these groups are a little bit far from the vertical lines, uh, sorry, uh, from the horizontal lines showing where monolingual native speakers of those languages are, which is to say both of them are kind of in the middle. Um, for the uh, native English speakers in Paris, the Americans in Paris, they're producing English T with shorter VOT than uh, monolinguals in the US would be pronouncing uh, this consonant. And then uh, uh, French women in Chicago are producing the French T with longer VT than they would in France. So these are um, two examples of uh, the phenomenon of L2 influence um, on the L1. Um, th those were people who learned the language, so they were obviously using the languages to some extent, but um, uh, some 
related work has has taken this question a little bit further to ask, um, you know, can can the native language, can the way you pronounce your native language change just from mere exposure to the a second language, even if you don't really speak it. So this work by um, Alfonso Karamazza and uh, Grace Yeni Komshin here from 1974, um, they were looking at um, people who speak French, but in different parts of the world, where in European French, um, that's much more of a French dominant environment. And uh, in Canada, in Quebec, for example, um, people are speaking French too, but then there's the, the presence of English in the environment is much greater. And so what you see in this graph on the y-axis is again that same property of VOT. And um, you see three consonants, P, T, and K on the um, x-axis. And there's two lines here. One line, uh, the, the white circles is for the uh, monolingual speakers of European French. Um, and then the black circles here are the um, supposedly monolingual French speakers um, who are living in Canada. So, so these are, are people living in Canada who claim not to speak English. Um, but, you know, they, they can't help being exposed to English because English is around them in the environment. And what is interesting to see here is that even in this case where the French speakers say that they don't speak English, um, the way they pronounced uh, their French consonants, P, T, and K, like what we saw in Flaggy, um, it also has longer VOT um, uh, uh, than the, the, the monolinguals in France. So, so this is another possible example of um, this L2 influence on uh, L1 pronunciation, even without using the L2. So, I mean, this type of result suggests that, you know, having the second language influence your first language is, is not that hard. It, it actually can happen quite easily um, because in this case we're seeing some evidence that is happening even without the person using or learning the, the second language. Um, so that type of result uh, and th that uh, body of work um, really uh, speaks to the idea that uh, you know the second language can can influence the native language in many different ways and and it doesn't necessarily require very specific conditions in order to happen um and you know there's there's someone uh named vivian cook who um predicted that this type of thing would happen and and he is uh, the researcher who proposed this idea of multi-competence and multi-competence is the idea that um the languages we know and uh, uh learn they are kind of um all, all within our consciousness, which is to say linguistic knowledge is fluid and holistic. It's not cleanly separated by language. So, you know, we have names for languages. So we might think that languages are very, you know, uh, clearly separated from each other in the individual's mind. This um, framework uh, kind of goes against that idea and considers the individual to uh, kind of uh, not not necessarily clearly separate their languages from each other and you know that's not a bad thing um, because in this um, uh, theory uh, when you learn a new language you're not just adding something it's not just mere accrual you're not adding you are uh, restructuring everything that you have in your mind that has to do with language and so this is actually a very different view um, compared to other linguists who study language learning of, of how the language learning process uh, proceeds. Here, someone who becomes so-called multi-competent, able to speak and understand multiple languages, it's not only that they speak more languages, it's that even the languages that they knew before learning a new language, now they have different knowledge of those languages because you know, now they have more languages to compare it to, for example. And this is a very different view of um, how language learning proceeds. Uh, that type of theory, I think, is interesting, um, and I, I'm highlighting here because it also points out the problems with uh, this term that appears all over um, linguistics and also just in, in common language usage of native speaker. Uh, you know, it's very t tough to define native speaker uh, when you adopt a framework like Vivian Cook's framework because um, it becomes unclear what a native speaker is. Is a native speaker uh, someone who only speaks that one language? Some people would say, okay. Is a native speaker anyone who started learning the language early in life? Um, even if they might not sound like they grew up with the language because you know maybe they switched to a different language um, later on. Uh, is a native speaker just anyone who's the model for, for a language learner? 
um, is native speaker is someone who is somehow like fully competent in the language, however we would want to define that. Um, there's no correct answer here. I, I think uh, native, native speaker is a very ambiguous term and, and it becomes even uh, more problematic um, in light of this kind of whole multi-competence idea. Um, <clears throat> in uh, maybe the latter half of the uh, 21st century, or sorry, the 20th century, um, uh, it became very in vogue for linguists to sort of equate native speakers with monolingual speakers. And um, this is, you know, problematic <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, uh, not all languages are spoken by monolinguals um, or even mostly by monolinguals. And um, the, this sort of view means that, uh, you know, you might adopt this view, but when you adopt this sort of view, then what uh, that sort of forces you to do is to uh, make sure that the people that you're looking at in terms of um, studying, uh, studying them as, as speakers of a language, it, it forces you to, to only look at monolingual speakers. And that would be okay if that's what actually you were doing. But as it turns out, um, linguists have unfortunately sometimes uh, adopted as examples of so-called native monolingual speakers, people who are not monolingual, but who would otherwise identify it as native speakers. And so the problem here is that these linguists are adopting what I call the immutability assumption, which is this idea that, you know, as long as you were a native speaker at one point in time, or you were very proficient, or, you know, you could convince people you were a native speaker at one point in time, you'll be like that for the rest of your life. The, the L1 proficiency, L1 ability is immutable. It won't change. Um, under that logic, then, yeah, it doesn't matter what type of uh, native speaker you look at. As long as the person was a native speaker at one, at one point in time, they'll always be a native speaker. Um, I'm just going to point out that this assumption is false, and, and that's basically going to be shown by everything I'm going to um, uh, show on the next uh, few slides about um, empirical results showing language change um, even in um, adulthood. Okay, so um, if you look across the literature, um, people have tried to get around this problem of uh, bilinguals not being the same as monolinguals by trying to define um, how much time someone can be in um, an L2 speaking environment and still resemble a monolingual native speaker. So this is the idea of length of residence in some foreign language environment. So um, sometimes in studies uh, that you read in linguistics, uh, people will you know, say that they're really interested in monolingual native speakers of a certain language, but they couldn't find them. And so instead they found people who were living in a certain place uh, which was not that language environment, but they'd only been living there for a short amount of time. So, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully they will resemble a monolingual native speaker. Um, maybe there's some logic to that, but uh, if you look across this literature, actually there's a huge range in the amount of time that um, people think that uh, uh, as long as you are in the foreign language environment for, for less than that, then you'll be like a monolingual. So anywhere from three months to, to two years. And um, what's interesting is that like, there's no basis for these uh, length of residence thresholds. It's I think just people picking numbers out of a hat. <laughs> so, uh, so this kind of leads us to the question, even if we were to adopt three months as the lower limit, uh, is that the right number? or you know, actually can a native language change in less than three months. And that's the, um, the suggestion of um, some of the work that I've done, uh, where if you look at um, people learning a language, a, a new language uh, right from the beginning, the very first weeks of people learning a language, even at that point in time, you start to see uh, changes in the way they're pronouncing their native language which suggests that, you know, all of these length of residence thresholds that, you know, I just referred to, they're all kind of, um, they don't make sense um, because uh, that length of residence does not guarantee that someone's going to look like a monolingual. But anyway, so that leads us to this question. Um, 
which comes from uh, the interpretation of some of the results that have to do with these initial L2 learning studies. Because uh, second language learning, you could say, is a very special experience, especially when it happens in a immersion environment or quasi-immersion environment where you're surrounded by that language, you're learning the language in the classroom and you're speaking it outside the classroom. Um, maybe, um, actually, that's exactly the, the point in time where you would expect second language influence to be strongest because, you know, the, the, the individual is so heavily engaged in terms of like mental energy in, in the second language. So, so you know, maybe, maybe it's actually natural to expect the second language influence to be strongest at that early point in time. Um, so that, that begs the question here of, okay, so if that's, you know, the case, then we would expect after second language learning ends uh, for, we would expect any changes that happen to the first language to kind of go back to, to the way they were at the beginning, or we'd expect those changes to go away and for pronunciation, for example, to return to what a monolingual speaker would do. Um, and that's uh, the question um, behind this work um, that I published last year in a 2019 study. If it's the case that there's something special about L2 learning, well, let's look after L2 learning at what happens. After L2 learning, will the first language return to what a monolingual speaker would do, or would it, or will it um, continue to look different, uh, persist as so-called drifted, as long as someone is in a second language environment? So that's the, that's the question here, um, because before that point, no one knew the answer. Um, and so the hypothesis here is um, that uh, this phenomenon of phonetic drift, so-called phonetic drift, so change in the native language due to recent um, second language experience, the idea is that this is based on not learning specifically, which it could have been, but it's not based on learning specifically, but it's really based on second language exposure. Um, so it is true that second language learning might provide the richest kind of second language exposure, but once you've learned the second language to some level, some intermediate level at least, um, you know actually quite a bit of the language, and that means that when you continue to be exposed to the language, um, you can't ignore it anymore. So if one way to think about this would be like, uh, if you think about the phenomenon of like sitting in a coffee shop or a restaurant in, you know, a language environment where the, you speak the language versus uh, being in that kind of situation where everyone around you is speaking a language that you don't understand, it is much harder to block out the speech or the language of uh, the language that you do understand. When you, when you know the language, it's harder to ignore it. Um, and that's, the, that's kind of the basis of the idea here. Once you get to the point of like knowing enough of the language, then you, you can't block out um, you know, speech that's just around you, even if people aren't talking to you. You kind of can't help um, paying attention to it a little bit and processing that. So the idea here, uh, based upon that logic, is that if you're a L1 speaker, uh, and you know something of this foreign language that is in the environment around you, even if you don't actually use that language very often, that L2 very often, you're going to continue to be influenced by being exposed to the second language and, you know, look a little bit different in your native language from the L1 norms, as long as you're living in that second language environment. Um, uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the basic idea. So, um, the follow-up work that I'm going to report has to do with a study in which um, I was looking at uh, native English speakers who uh, were learning Korean for the first time. And this is in the context of them having gone to Korea and they are um, getting ready to be uh, teachers. But um, before they do that, they undergo this very intensive uh, Korean instruction uh, regimen. Uh, and in the early work that looked at what exactly happens when they're um, in the middle of that instruction, when they're engaged in the learning, um, what, what I found was that um, three aspects, three main aspects of their uh, English pronunciation change while they're learning Korean. But one thing is this VOT dimension. Um, the Korean stops, stop consonants, their PTK, that are the most similar to the English stops, have much longer uh, 
voice onset time, this VOT variable. And so the way Korean influences English in this case is to result in a lengthened VOT for those English uh, stops, PTK. Um, Korean also, uh, after those consonants, has kind of an elevated voice pitch, uh, elevated F0. And th so the way that Korean ends up influencing English uh, while, while people are learning is um, the F0 following the English PTA, PTK goes up, it gets raised. And then the English vowels, um, or vowel system, I should say, uh, differs from Korean's vowel system in that if you kind of average over all the Korean vowel, con uh, vowel sounds, um, the overall system is a little bit um, <clears throat> lower in this dimension called F1 uh, than the English vowel system. And so the result then in terms of Korean influencing English becomes that the English vowel system decreases in this F1 dimension over time. All of these have to do with English becoming a little bit more like Korean. So these are all things that happened while uh, these native English speakers were actively engaged in learning Korean. So they were going to Korean class like four hours a day for several weeks. And, and it was that time period during which I saw these changes happening. So the question is, you know, after that, that's all, all over, you know, does this continue to happen or do these changes go away? Um, so what I did um, to follow up on those results was to um, call back the people who participated in the initial study uh, about a year after they uh, had started uh, learning Korean. Um, and I divided these two groups into, uh, according to how much they reported using Korean over the time between the end of their Korean language classes and the, the time of testing this last test. And so there's two groups, a low use group and a high use group. And um, they are pretty similar on many dimensions that I asked them about in a questionnaire. And this dimension that I've highlighted in red here is really the principal dimension in which uh, they're, they differ. And, and they're, the, the, the names of the groups are low use and high use because that is the dimension in which they differ. The high use group reports speaking Korean much more per week, many more hours per week than the low use groups. The low use group is not, not speaking Korean at all, but they are speaking Korean much less than the um, high use group. So that's uh, the, gonna be the group comparison that we'll look at in um, some of the, the pictures. <clears throat> okay, so just to, to uh, summarize some of the uh, methodological details from the initial study. Uh, here again, we have a period of L2 learning where people are undergoing intensive Korean instruction, and that happens for, uh, for six weeks. And so I um, take measurements of their speech at the end of weeks one, two, three, four, and five. And then, you know, these people go off and do their teaching responsibilities. During that time, some of them might take some additional classes and so on. Um, but importantly, whenever they take some additional classes, there's at least like three months between them stopping the instruction and then this last test um, that I'm gonna show you. Uh, what they're doing during these tests is basically just reading words. So it's a pretty simple task. They read English words um, that, that are presented to them on the computer screen in random order. And the, the way they do this is exactly the same in every single week of the study. Um, these are just monosyllabic words like pot and heed and so on. They're English um, words of one syllable. And then um, what I'm going to be showing you are the data from me doing some acoustic analysis of these properties that I've, I've been talking about. VOT, the F0 um, in the following vowel, and then uh, these properties of the vowels, um, F1 and F2, which are correlated with how high the tongue is in the mouth and kind of how far back, uh, how front or back the tongue is in the mouth. Okay, and then <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about the statistics, but um, uh, We'll, we'll take a look at some of these results in the plots. So this first plot I'm showing you is um, uh, depicting development in this VOT variable, which is again that aspiration variable uh, it measured in milliseconds, over um, the first five weeks of me measuring their English pronunciation during the Korean language classes, and then at this last time point, which is 52 weeks later. So about a year after they moved to Korea. And the, the main lines I'd like you to pay attention to are the, the dark uh, blue line and the black line, which are showing English 
in the high use group in blue, and then the low use group in uh, black. The gray and light blue lines, I'm just providing for reference because these are the, the data for the Korean stop series, you know, the L2 that they're actually learning. Um, and so, of course, you can see in that gray and light blue line that there is some change going on in those L2 stops, which is to say they're learning something. They're learning, they're getting better at, at pronouncing these Korean stops. But what is interesting is that you also see related changes in um, the English stops that are here in the uh, dark blue and black lines. So from week one to five, in both the uh, high use group and the low use group, you're seeing this increase in BOT over time. And the crucial thing here that I'd like to point out is that from week five to 52, um, something different happens between the two groups. Um, and, and that's what's represented in this time uh, by group interaction. Uh, whereas the high use group continues to lengthen their VOT. So from week five to 52, VOT still goes up. Uh, for the low use group in black, VOT goes back down. Um, and so by the time you get to week 52, actually the low use group, uh, they're right around where they started in week one. So week 52 is very similar to week uh, one. Whereas for the high use group, week 52 is, is much higher still, it's significantly higher than week one, which is to say, you know, they're still different from the way they started. Um, the picture looks uh, a little bit different for F0. So this is uh, related to voice pitch and the vowel following a consonant. And um, here you see, yeah, again, kind of an increase in F0 over time in both the low use group and the high use group. Um, but then there's a drop in both groups, in both groups, but the amount of the drop is different for the two groups where the high use group drops a little and the low use group drops a lot. And what that results in, uh, oh, or, you know, so there's a different amount of, the de of a decrease. However, it is still the case that for both groups, even despite this decrease from week five to 52, in week 52, they're still significantly higher, that are a higher level of F0 than they started out in uh, at week one. Okay, and so um, F1 is this, um, vowel height dimension, so kind of how related to how uh, high the tongue is in the mouth when you're saying a vowel sound. And what you're seeing on the y-axis here is just average uh, average, uh, uh, <laughs> average F1 uh, over the vowel system, uh, just for English. And um, I am um, just going to point out here that um, the, uh, from week five to 52, um, again, you see the groups look different from each other. So week one to five, they're, they're showing pretty similar uh, development, which is the slight decrease over time. And then from week five to 52, they both go up a little, but uh, actually the low use group goes up a lot more than the high use group. Um, and so that, that results in a picture in which, you know, for the high use group, in week 52, they're actually pretty much at the point that they were at in week one, but for the low use group, in fact, week 52 is, is a little bit, um, uh, well, actually that should be the other way around. Week 52 is actually less than it is in week one. I mean, here the crucial point is that they're different in week 52 than they were in week one. Um, and then for F2, this is the frontness backness dimension of where the uh, tongue is in the mouth. Um, here, the groups look actually very similar to each other. And what you see for both of them is that basically you just keep going up in F2 over time. And that continues from between week, fifth, uh, week five and week 52. Um, and that results in a scenario in which both groups in week 52 are still different than they were in week one. Okay, so um, let me just pause there to, to point out that, okay, so after people have ended um, second language learning, as long as they're in the second language environment, there seems to be very persistent changes in their uh, first language, um, you know, as long as they're in the second language environment. Because, you know, my argument here is that they're still, you know, exposed to the second language and they might not be using it very much, but like they can't help like kind of paying attention to it because they know the language now. That um, doesn't address the question of, 
what will happen or what could happen if those people move back to the US? So they exit Korea and they're no longer in the second language environment and they are re immersed in the first language environment. I didn't do that study, uh, but someone did something very similar. And I'm going to uh, talk about that work uh, quickly because I think it's very, very interesting. Um, so this is work by <coughs> Natalia Kartushina and Clara Martin, also published just last year. And they um, looked at uh, L3 learning, so third language learning, because the learners they were looking at were already bilingual. So these were people from Spain uh, who were bilingual in Spanish and Basque. And the learning context that these people were put into was um, <coughs> they uh, studied abroad in Holland through this Erasmus program uh, for two weeks. And during that time, they were participating in a bunch of activities that that were all done in English, even though they were not actually language classes. So this study abroad program was not sending them to go study English. It was studying, uh, sending them abroad to like have debates about politics and so on in English, um, but there was actually no language instruction. So they're, they're being engaged in, in uh, this third language uh, English, but they're not actually studying it. So um, what uh, Kortushina and Martin did was very similar to, to what I just talked about. Uh, they had these people read uh, words in all of their languages uh, multiple, at multiple points um, over time. So they had this um, group do a word reading task three times in particular. They had them do it uh, before they went to study abroad. So while they were still in Spain, they had them do it right after they finished study abroad. And then they had them do it four months after they came back to Spain. So after the study abroad program, all these people come back to Spain. And so after four months uh, uh, of the living in Spain again, then they had them do this task again. And so those are the three time periods you'll see in these graphs um, coming up. Um, so yeah, the materials are very similar. The English words are monosyllabic. And then they also have um, uh, the participants read words in Spanish and Basque that are disyllabic, two syllables. OK, <clears throat> so the first result I think that is interesting is that um, for the, the language that is being uh, learned or kind of um, that is the, the language of the environment during study abroad, so this is the L3 English, um, the vowels uh, improve uh, in terms of their pronunciation relative to what a monolingual uh, native speaker would do at least. So this um, y-axis is showing how <laughs> How far away on average um, the, the L3 English vowels of these learners are compared to what the target should be. So if we think about the target being like kind of what a monolingual native English speaker would do, um, the lower this number is, uh, the, the more native-like or the more monolingual-like at least um, the learner's pronunciation is. So time one, recall, is um, showing uh, before study abroad, time two is right after study abroad, and then time three is four months after they've been in Spain again. And what you see in this graph is that um, from time one to time two, the bar goes down, which is to say that, I mean, what that means is that these learners' English vowels are, are getting better I mean, from the point of view of they're, they're getting more native-like. The distance between their vowel productions and what a native speaker would do goes down. However, <laughs> um, that, that improvement doesn't last because what you see from time two to time three is that um, you know, after their study abroad uh, and they're back in Spain again for several months, uh, presumably using English less, um, now, now the distance from the target vowels goes back up. Um, so, I mean, the, the summary here is that like uh, L2 immersion, or uh, in this case, um, L3 immersion, is improving the pronunciation of the L3, but uh, once that stops, that experience stops, and, and the um, learners are re-immersed in their previously learned languages, then those L3 gains kind of go away be, uh, because you know the, the L3 is being used presumably less often. So, um, so that's an interesting pattern of change over time 
in the, the new language that they were uh, being immersed in. But um, Cartuchina and Martin also did a very similar measure on the already learned languages in Spanish in particular. So these were bilinguals and one of the languages that they knew from the beginning was Spanish. Uh, and also very early in life. So these um, people are, are bilinguals from early in life. Um, so in this case, we're looking at Spanish um, F1. So this is that height dimension. And the times are the same. What you see is that from time one to time two, <clears throat> uh, there is a drift in the Spanish vowels, um, ostensibly due to the uh, exposure to English. Um, and in this case, the, the drift uh, in, uh, increases the F1, which makes sense from the point of view of comparing English and Spanish vowels. The interesting thing is that, again, after the learners have been back in Spain for several months, that change that happened due to study abroad goes away. And you see this kind of return drift back to what a Spanish native speaker uh, would pronounce uh, in terms of these vowels. Um, Cartuchina and Martin also uh, tried to relate these two changes to each other. And um, in these two plots, what you're seeing on the left in the A, uh, the, the plot labeled A, is um, uh, drift in the uh, Spanish vowel pronunciation compared to how much the learner improved in English pronunciation right after the study abroad on the, the horizontal, the x-axis. And the takeaway from the, the plot on the left is that the learners who make the most progress in English, so the people who are all the way on the right here, they tend to be the ones who show the least amount of drift in their Spanish due to the English exposure. Um, what's being shown in the plot on the right, the B plot, is kind of related because uh, what you see in the B plot is that the learners who make the least uh, progress in English during the study abroad, so the people who are all the way on the left, they're the ones who show the most drift back to native norms uh, after the study abroad. And presumably this is because those were also the people whose Spanish vowels changed the most while they were learning English. So they changed the most, so they had the most room to return back to the Spanish uh, norms. And like, again, here, the, the people who were uh, really improving in their English, they don't drift back to the Spanish norms um, that much because they never drifted that much to begin with. Okay, um, the last thing I wanna mention about this study, which I think is very, very interesting, is that um, the authors were curious as to variation in how people use the languages that they know. And one of the dimensions that we know bilinguals differ in terms of is um, switching, switching between the languages. Some bilinguals switch all the time. Some bilinguals almost never switch because what they do is they speak one language to one group of people and then another language to a different group of people. So there's really no occasion for them to switch. Whereas other bilinguals, they're, they're speaking both languages to the same people. So they might switch quite frequently. So what um, Cartuchina and Martin did is they uh, asked people to kind of rate how often they switch languages, uh, just you know, uh, according to their memory. And the, that variable called switching frequency is on the horizontal here. So it's just kind of normalized from one to four. Um, and then what you see on the y-axis uh, is change uh, in these vowels that we've been we've been talking about measured in terms of Hertz. So the plot on the, the plots on the left and, and each plot by the way I, I should show is, is showing two subgroups of bilinguals because some of these bilinguals were very were more balanced in terms of how much they use uh, Basque and Spanish and some of them uh, reported using Spanish more so these are the Spanish dominant bilinguals but you see actually pretty similar patterns in both of these um, subgroups. So the plot on the left, uh, the takeaway here is that as you go kind of to the right, as frequent, uh, switch, frequency of switching goes up, um, you see uh, the lines being closer to zero. The, they basically go down. Um, and what the way we can interpret this is that uh, the people who switch the most, they tend to show the least drift in their um, Spanish. And, and here, actually, we also see that the same um, 
data for Basque. For both their Basque vowels and their Spanish vowels, those vowels of the L1 and the L2 change less as the uh, frequency of people's language switching goes up. The plot on the right is um, showing something related, which has to do with this idea of return drift again. So um, for the people who switch more, the more frequent switchers, they also tend to show less return drift. <clears throat> and again, that is presumably because they didn't actually show that much drift to begin with. These people who are frequent switchers tend to be the people who show less drift of Basque and or Spanish. And therefore, there's less room for them to go back to, to the way they were um, to, to show this return drift. Okay, so what does this all mean? What can we take away from this? Um, the first uh, thing that I think we can take away is that um, the second language or some additional or later learned language can have a profound influence on the way you produce your native language. And that influence um, is, is pretty, it can be pretty persistent, even though it doesn't look exactly the same across what we measure. So for some cases, um, it seems like maybe you need to uh, frequently actively speak it in order to um, kind of promote this second language influence on, on the uh, L1 pronunciation. In other cases, it seems like that's not necessary. Um, clearly, what's the case in, in that pattern of results is that you don't actually need to be actively uh, learning in terms of formal instruction a second language in order to see this um, influence of the second language on um, L1 pronunciation. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that certainly supports this idea that, uh, you know, Cook, Vivian Cook, um, formalized where someone who is a speaker of an L1, a native speaker, who becomes multi-competent in some other languages, uh, especially when they're living in uh, an environment where that native language is not spoken, they cannot be uh, equated with monolinguals, you know, which is not a bad thing. That's not a value judgment. It's just a fact that, you know, people who are uh, bilingual, they are not like monolinguals. Um, and that seems to be the case even when we're talking about people who are actually not super proficient in the second language and people who don't necessarily use the second language very often or people who are uh, you know, living in the second language environment for not that much time. Um, all of these things seem to have the uh, ability to make someone not look like a so-called monolingual native speaker anymore. The um, important contribution of Cartouchine and Martin, I think, is this idea that um, it's both the frequency and the circumstances of how you use your native language or your you know, previously learned languages that are very important to how authentically or how kind of monolingually or natively you uh, continue to produce your native language. Because what they are seeing in their work is that um, uh, aspects of how people use the languages that they've already learned um, seem to influence the degree to which those languages change uh, when a new language enters the repertoire. Um, so uh, what I'd like to leave you with is just a couple of questions which um, you know I think are still outstanding questions in the field. Um, there is the work of Karamatsa and uh, Yeni Kamshin that seems to suggest that you know just being exposed to another language in the environment ambiently can influence the way you produce your native language. Um, but it's not really clear that their example is uh, really people who don't know the language at all. Uh, Canada, I think, is um, a special context in terms of its bilingualism. And it's not clear that even people who claim that they don't know English uh, don't actually, actually don't know any English or, or don't speak it at all. So it's, it's, I think this is still an outstanding question. How, what is the degree to which just being exposed to a language that you don't know might influence the way you speak your native language? Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's a promising avenue of future research there. And then the other question that I think is um, a challenging question to address, uh, and, you know, no one's really looked at this, I think, because it, it, it would be, um, uh, difficult to, to carry out this long of a study um, is this question of, uh, okay, so you've learned a second language and then you might, or you might be even in an immersion environment 
and then you go back to your native language environment um, and you might stop using that second language. Maybe you completely stop using that second language. Um, that doesn't uh, eliminate the possibility that some, some way, somehow, having learned that second language might you know, still make you a different native speaker of your native language than someone who never, heard, never had that second language learning experience. So, so the question here is, you know, when you have a second language experience, uh, can that continue to have some lasting effect on the way you use language in general, um, even you know, many, many years down the line? Are there any lasting traces of this, of this experience? I think that's going to be an interesting question for the field to look at in the future as well. Um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, all I have. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm very happy to take any questions. So many people contributed to this, uh, this research funding bodies, as well as um, collaborators and um, people who inspired a lot of these questions. So I'd like to thank all of them, of course, and, and here's all my contact information as well, in case you'd like to take a look at any of these uh, papers. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for your talk, uh, Professor Shank. Um, I have a few questions here that I, you know. Should I, should I, I start sharing my screen? Uh, uh, yes, and okay. then I can pin your video, okay, so that everybody can see. Okay, so we have a few questions here uh, in our Q&A. Uh, but first, I'd like to, you know, uh, ask you uh, a few questions that I have, like myself, and then try to bring those questions uh, here somehow. Um, Basically, the studies that you discuss in your lecture show that language exposure, um, that is immersion in a new linguistic environment, plays a major role in uh, language acquisition in general. Uh, and it also shows that even our native language can be re reshaped by, by uh, language contact. It's not so uncommon to hear anymore from people that they know somebody who spent some time abroad and then they came back home like sounding like differently. I have like a recollection when I was a teenager. I know this this girl from my hometown. She spent like five years in the U.S. and then she paid me a visit. But she was like sounding like so funny. I said, "What what happened to Vanessa?" So, this is one of the early, early recollections that I, that I have. And also, uh, by talking to a to a Native American living in Brazil, uh, and she has been living here for a long time. And then she said that every time she goes back to 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 the U.S. Um, she says that um, her fellow Native Americans say, oh, you sound differently, like your accent is like softer. So, you know, so, well, I, I, I've been hearing these stories like here uh, and, and, and there, and even um, our Korean teacher, I know, she was also like questioned by other uh, native speakers of Korean because she moved to Brazil when she was 13. And then, well, she's around like 30 right now. And then she said that, you know, people said, oh, are you Korean? You know, because she said, oh, I'm Korean. So she was questioned uh, about her, you know, uh, nativeness, <laughs> let's put it this way, like being a native uh, Korean. So the first question uh, I'd like to, to ask you is, um, what, what inspired you to, to uh, conduct this, this study? I'm referring specifically to the study that you conducted in your PhD. Right. So what inspired you? What was there like any inspiration? Because we see that language attrition is still under researched, at least in Brazil. So we have like maybe one, two or three um, names that you can mention. So could you tell us uh, what inspired you? And if there's like many more people interested in, in the topic right now in the US and elsewhere? Sure. Um, so I was sort of inspired to look at this type of um, reverse language influence um, just by my own experience of kind of participating in this type of uh, language immersion program myself and having that experience of um, people tell me either that I sounded different or even like uh, from introspection feeling like I somehow was less fluent or was speaking differently than I remember speaking before uh, so my native language is English and yeah I, I definitely had that experience myself and so that just made me curious about um, what the time course of this type of, you know, uh, development is. I, in, in the title to this talk, I've, I've called this attrition, of course, but but it's not clear that um, that is the great the greatest way to refer to it. I think attrition um, carries this implication of of loss, and um, 
I'm using the term, I think, more broadly to refer to just kind of change, in particular change that's brought about by additional language knowledge. And if, if you think about um, kind of the way Cook uh, conceptualizes of, of uh, how languages evolve in, in an individual's repertoire uh, over time, then, um, you know, attrition is sort of expected and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, so, so that's, I, I think, really kind of what inspired me, just um, having that personal experience of, of experiencing, uh, yeah, of undergoing these changes to my native language and wondering uh, how this gets all, how this all gets started kind of at the beginning. Um, a lot of the attrition, so to your second question, a lot of the um, attrition researchers um, are actually based in Europe. Um, so one of, one of the biggest names I think in this area is Monica Schmidt. And so she's at the University of Essex. Um, and uh, Esther DeLeo is, uh, works a lot on phonetic attrition in particular, phonetic and phonological attrition. And she's at the um, uh, University of London, Queen Mary. Um, so I, I actually am curious as to why so many researchers in attrition are in Europe. It might be because I think um, a lot of multilingual contexts are, are there in, in, you know, regionally. And so there are a lot of opportunities to look at uh, uh, immigration and, and people being in foreign language contexts and, and, you know, maybe experiencing some change to their native language. Um, but yeah, yeah, there are definitely people in the US too um, that, that are looking at this phenomenon as well. That's very interesting. And okay, a question that I have myself as well is because um, as I mentioned earlier, like I, I know some people who like spent like long time abroad and then they, they have their, you know, speech patterns like be shaped by, you know, a language immersion in a new environment. But uh, how early would you say that um, a second language would influence the linguistic patterns of one's native language? Of course, you mentioned here and there in, in, in the studies, but what, what was the earliest? That, the, uh, that has been has been attested right because some of these changes might happen even though we cannot like hear them it, it doesn't mean that they are not happening right i mean so in the uh the original uh study that i was following up on in the 2019 paper so that's um a 2012 study um we we saw i mean i basically saw uh people starting to significantly diverge from what their baseline was in some cases in week two of their language program. So, I mean, it seems like for some uh, properties of people's speech, you're, you're getting a change that, you know, uh, I would guess is detectable. Of course, I didn't actually test specifically whether people could hear it, but at least in terms of the measurements, um, you're getting a change that is, you know, significant uh, very early within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, it, so one, one thing that I want to emphasize, and, and I brought this up towards the end of um, today's talk, is that this type of phenomenon um, definitely seems to uh, be variable di uh, across, you know, different things that we could measure. Or to put it differently, you know, the, the trajectory of the change uh, is likely to uh, differ somewhat depending on like the specific thing that we're talking about. Um, certainly we've seen this type of change across many uh, aspects of the native language uh, production, but um, uh, the individual properties that we look at, some of them might change more quickly or they might change slower. And then some of them, when there is a change, uh, the change seems to be very persistent. And then for, some, for other ones, the change seems to kind of go away more, more easily and maybe maybe require some active L2 use to, to kind of uh, keep going on. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's important to keep in mind. But um, in terms of just the possibility of rapid change, that, that much is clear. Yeah, change can happen very quickly. That's very interesting. I think that one of our speakers, Magdalena Golden, has a question. So you're on, you can speak. Magdalena? Uh, hi, yes. Um, I'm, I actually wanted to ask a question about the special case of Canada because um, the claim seems to be that the French speakers are influenced by the English speakers, um, even though they don't speak English. But I was wondering, could that not be explained by just the difference between Canadian version of French and the French version of French, meaning the French speakers 
in Canada would be influenced by bilingual um, speakers within their region rather than the English speakers that they don't understand. Could that be a, another possibility? Uh, no, I think that's a great point. Um, we don't know exactly what the mechanism of how those uh, Canadian French speakers have, you know, ended up at the pronunciation norms that, that they're showing. It, it could be, yeah, definitely in particular across generations of, of people uh, interacting with, of monolinguals interacting with bilinguals. It could be the case that um, maybe the, the, the bilinguals are the, the conduit through which we are getting this type mm -hmm. of change because the bilinguals through some sort of cross-linguistic interaction in, in their own mind are producing French a little bit differently. And, and that change is kind of also p passing on to the, the monolingual speakers. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's I think, I, th I think we can't say for sure uh, how large of a role that's playing. Yeah. yeah, um, it just, I, would, yeah. I would suspect that it does play a role just because um, independently of this work, we know mm -hmm. that when people interact with each other, at least in the short term, there tends to be influence of how one person pronounces things on the way people another person pronounces that word like very soon after. Yeah, it seems to me like it's a similar case of really what's happening in Ireland. Like there are plenty of Irish people who do not speak a word of Irish really, or very little, but um, they are influenced. Like, um, for example, there is a grammar influence of like overuse of myself, me, myself, I, blah, 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 um, that from what I understand stems from the Gaelic Irish um, that is not spoken by the people who overuse this structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think um, the the fact that this is a possible um, root of, of this uh, influence uh, really kind of, you know, provides even more of an impetus to really get at this question of like how much and, and how, it, through what route does ambient L2 exposure come to influence the way people pronounce a language? Um, presumably there is a large social component. So like, can this happen even without that social component? I think that's mm -hmm. a question we don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. And I, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, it's regarding slides 15 and 16. I wonder if it's possible for you to share them again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's, let's see here. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right, so if I understand correctly, um, the black line are the people who use, um, was it Korean? Yes, they use Korean less, the yeah. blue ones use Korean more, mm -hmm. but it seems to me like overall the people who use Korean more less are like started uh, in a kind of being more similar to the way Korean is pronounced. Yeah. Um, is there an explanation for that? Like why would yeah. the people who use Korean more that's actually, really you know? Question. Yeah, that's a really good question. One thing that I want to point out about these plots is that um, week one here is not really the baseline because week one is uh, after they've had Korean for one week. Mm -hmm. So um, really the baseline would be week zero. And unfortunately, I was just not able to measure what their English looked like at that point in time. So um, the, the, my, my interpretation of what's going on here is that um, the LU, the low use group, um, actually experienced more change uh, to their English in that time period between week zero and week one. Mm, and the, the reason why that might have happened is um, uh, due to something that I kind of glossed over, um, that there's another way in which the low use group and the high use group differ from each other. It is that the low use group, um, those learners are mostly unfamiliar with Korean before they start this Korean language program, whereas the high use learners mostly had some previous experience with Korean uh, before mm -hmm. entering this program. I mean, the, the, the classes that these two groups are in are basically the same in terms of a curriculum and also um, duration of instruction. But um, in other work, I've made the argument that um, when you uh, don't, when you, when, when a language is completely new to you, 
that it, somewhat counterintuitively that that increases the likelihood that you are going to be influenced by that new language when you start learning it because mm -hmm. it's you know it's just like so novel um and so everything is maybe a little bit more stimulating or kind of captures more of your attention than it might mm -hmm. if you are learning this language but like you've actually learned it before so it's not completely new to you that that, yeah, that it way, makes right? sense yeah yeah so so that is kind of my um, explanation of why these two groups start off actually quite different in week one okay thank you yeah thank mm -hmm. you very much mm -hmm. hello we have some questions here in the q a session uh i'm going to read them okay mm -hmm. So Gabriel asked, uh, do you have a personal experience in feeling mo more comfortable with pronunciation in your own L2, L3 at specific moments like traveling abroad or after a long conversation with a native speaker? Um, I think it, I think there's definitely a warm up period <laughs> from, for my uh, non-native languages, especially if I've not um, been speaking them for a while, for a while. Uh, uh, I definitely get this feeling of, you know, becoming much more fluent in it after I've, you know, been in the conversation or been in the country, for example, for, for some time. And then, um, then I feel like uh, the language is activated in a way that it wasn't at the beginning. Yeah. Okay, okay. There, there's and a, oh. Yeah, there's another a more question like from another person, Bana Jan. What's an example of a voiceless stop? Does it correlate or conflate with the English glottal stop? And what's the voiceless stops usage? Um, yeah, so there are a lot of voiceless stops. Um, in English, uh, glottal stop, uh, actually glottal stop would count as a voiceless stop, but in this case, I'm not counting it um, in the, the set of stops that I'm calling voiceless stops because glottal stop doesn't have any possibility of aspiration because there's, there's nothing in the mouth that is going on. It's just stuff that's happening at the glottis. So that the particular voiceless stops that I was talking about in the presentation and that I was uh, measuring uh, the OT for were uh, P, T, and K. The, the sounds that are spelled with P, T, and K in, um, in English. Yeah. And the last question I have here is, in your opinion, what's the best way to learn a second language? And is there a better way? Um, that's a great question. It's a very broad question. I feel like I don't have a, a good answer to that, except that um, everyone is different. There are these huge individual differences between learners. And like the, the way that it will work for one person is probably not going to be the best way for another person. Um, one thing that I will say is that I'm confident saying is, is usually beneficial, regardless of who we're talking about, is um, the social aspect. Um, like language is definitely, I think, not something that uh, can be contained in a book. Um, and so, uh, you know, e even in some of the, the, the responses to questions that, that have already come up, I think it's clear that, you know, the way you learn a language is largely through interaction and like talking to other people. And so I think that's the, the component that, um, in particular, if you're fo following like a formal uh, instructional course it could be missing or uh, lacking and that I think a learner needs to kind of make an effort to to carry out on their own in terms of like making friends who speak in that language with you or going out into the community and doing activities that, that are engaged in, in with, with that language because uh, I, I think that's a very important component yeah Okay, do you have, Julian, do you have time for like more questions? I don't know if anyone in the audience would yes, like to we, ask we have any time questions. actually yeah. Um, well, uh, I don't know if some of you um, uh, wish to ask in Portuguese, so we have interpretation, so you can ask in Portuguese, and then uh, Charles, you can use the interpretation uh, icon you can see on your screen, right? So if se alguém quiser fazer alguma pergunta em português, tem interpretação, okay? So if you want to ask any any question in Portuguese, uh, you have uh, an interpreter, okay? Anyone? Um, because if you don't, like I have a like one last question you know to close uh, um, the session and it regards like the, the work that you <laughs> that you carried out in, in language attrition so one question I'd like to ask is is there any study on language attrition focusing on like prosody intonation or is is it like research has been mostly focused on like vowels and consonants like segments 
And also, in your opinion, what is the most challenging aspect in uh, language attrition um, research? Because, I mean, if you want to have like a, like a real robust study, like with many participants who, who share the same like social history, the same place, you know, who, who share many, many like um, social uh, similarities, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, to your first question, yeah, there are definitely people who've been looking at um, change or attrition in pros prosodic aspects of the native language. So two that come to mind, um, one of them is, is someone I mentioned already, Esther DeLeo at Queen Mary University of London. So she has, has looked at prosody or attrition of prosody. And the other person that comes to mind is Inika Menon. Inika Menon is at the University of Graz now, I think in Austria. And uh, yeah, so one uh, study that she did that I think is well known and like widely cited has to do with um, uh, Dutch Greek bilinguals and how their intonation, in particular, how the like the way they align the pitch contour with with the segmental structure of the speech uh, differs from people who are more um, dominant or monolingual in Dutch and uh, same thing in Greek. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's interesting work and, and it, it uh, shows clearly that you can get attrition in, in something like intonation um, and that there are um, interesting influences of what the segmental structure of the language is as well. And like what, what types of, in, in the case of that study, what types of vowel contrasts there are. Um, to your second question, um, sorry, I forgot it. What was the second question? Oh, about the, the challenges in the, in, oh, in, the, in the studies. Yeah. Right, right. So um, I think that attrition research, like acquisition research actually, is challenging because um, it, it involves time. And um, one, uh, you know, great, great way to observe a development or change over time to carry out a longitudinal study. And, and in, you know, from, from a, um, in like a perfect world, we would do all of our studies longitudinally because actually that would be the, the perfect, that would be the ideal way to observe development over time. You look at the same people and therefore you control for, for the individual, you look at the same people and how they changed over time, change over time. Um, the, Longitudinal work is challenging because um, because you have to track those people over time. People drop out of a study for one reason or another. Like you can't force people to stay in a study, especially if it's going to be something that takes years. Um, and yet, like that that time period, or or you know, the, the further you track people in time, the more interesting it gets because then you can say more things about what exactly happened to their language development or their language proficiency over time. Um, so I think that challenge applies both to uh, learn uh, acquisition research and attrition research. Um, but but if I were to compare the two, actually, I think it's even more challenging for attrition research because um, that population that uh, you know is undergoing attrition is is more specific, um, depending on like what what your research question is. Which is to say, it, it's harder to find the people that you would recruit for a study. Uh, depending on like how, how much time you want to track them over and what their language background needs to be. Um, so I think that's probably the major reason why you don't see more people maybe do attrition research because it is inherently challenging actually to carry it out, I think, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's easier to do like case studies, right? And I think more robust studies are, are, are more difficult because I think in your, in your dissertation you investigated like, about like 20 yeah 20 mm -hmm. participants mm -hmm. right so uh, so did you keep them like uh from the beginning to end so i started with 40 and then you had like 20 at the end right yeah so the, the, the number the number who completed the study was 20 like 19 or 20 i forget uh mm -hmm. but the number who started the study right was close to 40 i think it was 36 maybe or something like this at the beginning which is to say you know like almost 20 people dropped out by, by the end mm -hmm. um and you know i would love for all 36 to have stayed in the study but you know <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's difficult. Um, it's right. a lot of commitment. So, I mean, like, uh, I'm, what this speaks to is the fact that, like, when you're running an, any sort of longitudinal study, you generally have to recruit more than you, you're going to need in the end because mm -hmm. you can sort of expect there, there are going to be some people who drop out. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I think that makes it challenging. And, and in particular, you know, there, there are some people who drop out whose background I think is, like, very interesting. And so it's, like, particularly a shame for them to drop out because then you can't really see how they're going to develop over time. But, you know, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes the challenge I see is, for example, some people are already, let's say, a, a, I don't know if you can say that, like a truth is. <laughs> some people have, have been gone through it. Uh, and then, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to track what they used to sound like before if you, if you haven't recorded that person as well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's interesting. Like the idea of... Um, and, and, you know, I don't think there's a lot of, been, of work that's been done on this uh, tracking people through multiple cycles, multiple ebbs and flows of language experience. I, I think often when you look at um, development studies, they are uh, observing people right when they're experiencing a change for the first time or, or getting exposed to something for the first time. But not a lot of studies are, are really looking at the, the long term here where, um, so like, this is the question that I referred to in like my last slide, like in the long term, what happens due to this um, initial early second language experience? Like if there's some sort of attrition that happens, okay, and then you follow that through one cycle and then they get reimmersed in their first language. But then, you know, maybe their circumstances change and then they move back to the country that they went to before or they, you know, have a partner or some sort of experience that brings them back into contact with that that uh, second language that has mostly gone unused in the interim. Like I, I really don't know of any studies that have really looked at this um, kind of ebb and flow uh, uh, phenomenon, which which happens clearly over life, but um, seems to be less common uh, than studies that are looking at kind of the initial the initial exposure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for for the lecture, for the talk, for answering our questions. Thanks I'm pretty sure that everybody enjoyed, even though we are in the like webinar format, like uh, <laughs> it's a little weird for some because, you know, some were sending messages like, I can't see anyone, you know, it's, you know, some people are just not used to this kind of format, but yeah. So, Juliano. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chang, for being here with us and explaining all of this. It's a very interesting, research and uh, you certainly answered many questions and uh, yeah we had I saw that people were happy to see their questions answered <laughs> terrific <laughs> yeah and uh, tomorrow we continue with the event anyway <laughs> all right so well if you want to uh, watch uh, lecture so well I think everybody knows here in this room right Juliana because this is an open lecture right so we might have people who uh, sign, signed up for like the event uh, over the weekend or not, but if you haven't, so uh, you should not miss it. So check Yeah, the, take a look at the uh, website. We have yeah. a very nice program. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Shang. Yeah. So uh, hope to talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks so, for Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good, Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thanks.